Hi, this is Lawrence Juber of Wings, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Isn't our theme music just wonderful? Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another broadcast of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we focus on what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of this show. Some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns, and that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. I can't can't believe I'm I'm uh, actually taking a break from Paul McCartney today, but I am. There we are. Hello. <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. It only but happens that, once once in a rare moment. That's true. But we should be thankful that the man is as busy as he is. Yeah, that's very true. On today's program, we have a special guest with us on the phone, and it's actually a name that you've heard us mention here on the show. And because it's not an author. That's true. Although he could be. He could be. He could be because I've seen his writing. He writes to me every single week. Okay. All these all these witticisms that he puts into his emails, which I'll talk about later on. But he actually is a very good writer himself. But um, his name is Michael Lynch, and he's actually the person who composed our music theme, the theme for Ken and Steve. And uh, we're actually, we have him as a guest for a few reasons. First of all, we're doing a show. Today's show is actually on a brand new documentary that just came out on the Dave Clark Five called Glad All Over. And this uh, documentary was recently shown on PBS stations. It was also available for a brief time on the Internet to stream. Now is available on DVD. And Michael is uh, pretty much an expert and a connoisseur, if you will, on uh, British rock and early British rock in particular. And uh, we welcome him to our show to talk about this new documentary on the Dave Clark Five. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Steve, and uh, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting about the DC Five today. Well, before we even talk about that, just want to let folks know that Michael and I actually go back a long ways, and there's uh, quite a Beatles connection there, too, because back in the early 90s, he was one of the co-hosts of a Beatles program that was heard on WBAU. That was part of a Delphi University station on Long Island, and it was called The Beatles and Beyond. And actually, before, you know, there's so many Beatles talk shows now on the Internet, so many podcasts. This was actually, you know, I was thinking about this not long ago, kind of way before its time. This show that Michael was a part of was mainly a talk show with a few songs mixed in. And it was basically about what was going on in the news. So Michael was doing this uh, over 20 years ago. Steve, long before oh, we were. I, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and in addition to that, he's also recorded a lot of music on his own and uh, is a big lover, as I said, of uh, 60s rock and British rock. And we wanted to get your take, Michael, on uh, this brand new documentary. As I said, it's called Glad All Over. And uh, first of all, what did you think of this documentary in general? I'd say in general it was pretty good. Um, as a showcase of you know, lots of good footage of them, you know, lots of uh, rare stuff. It was great. Um, a lot of those clips I'd never seen before. Um, I especially liked the London Palladium clip where they were singing 19 Days, and I think they were actually doing it live, if I remember. Uh, yeah, that one That one was live. That one and that's, was. Rare, that's rare. It's very rare you see a clip of them uh, playing live. So that alone was great. And uh, I, it's just great that they were getting two hours of that time and attention. So that was fun. Uh, but here comes the but. Uh, <laughs> As a good biography, well, um, I didn't learn much. Uh, it wasn't a thorough biography, but uh, but to be fair, you know, maybe it wasn't supposed to be. Maybe it was just supposed to be a celebration of what they did. And if so, then it was well done. Uh, but I guess I went in thinking it was going to be more like, uh, I don't know, uh, Clarkology. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as soon as I saw that Dave Clark himself was behind the special, which uh, I don't think I knew until the special began and I saw it on the screen, uh, or Dave Clark Productions, whatever it was, uh, I stopped expecting anything uh, too thorough. Well, but, uh, I mean, especially with that last half hour where he devoted it to uh, time and 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 all his, you know, and all his, and everybody praising him. 
it was, yeah, I mean, that it's hard to, I mean, that's like any um, John Lennon Imagine, for example, that was, that had Yoko involved in it and everything. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. There's not going to be a whole lot of, although John Lennon Imagine, I think, was a little more thorough than this was, but yeah. But, I mean, I, I liked all the TV, the rare TV clips that were in it. That, and I'd forgotten about the TV special that they'd done with Lucille Ball. And I thought that was great. And uh, also in that clip, you mentioned that clip where they sing 19 Days. I think either just before it or I think it was just after it, they sing Georgia on my mind, which absolutely freaked me out because I had never heard them sing that. But, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a, I mean, on the good side, there was a lot of rare music. There was, it, it was strange to i mean a lot of it was dated it wasn't a lot of it wasn't really new because you had freddie mercury in there and a lot of other you know and a lot of people who looked you know older or i should say younger and so um what's wrong with that a lot of that stuff had been done a long time ago and i guess updated but um for you know i mean i think the dave clark five deserved that it's too bad they didn't do that around the time they went in the hall of fame but right from my perspective, first of all, I, I, I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert on the Dave Clark Five. I grew up in the 60s listening to Top 40 radio, and I was very familiar with the hits of the Dave Clark Five. I love their singles, and I've always loved their singles. And, in fact, I probably love the singles more now than I ever have before. But I never went deep into their catalog. I never studied their album cuts. And that's you know why I wanted to bring Michael along for the show. And I enjoy the documentary a lot. I don't know if I learned all that much. The only major drawback for me in watching this is that it's basically Dave Clark telling the story himself with a few clips of Mike Smith talking, but you never hear anything from the other three members of the group. Mm -hmm. So I would have liked to have known from their perspective what it was like to be in the band, but it was more about why the Dave Clark Five were an influence, which, as far as I'm concerned... One of the reasons why I wanted to watch this documentary was to find out in this day and age how important the Dave Clark Five are now in terms of history and who did they influence, if any, people. And it became very apparent to me after watching this particular special, you know, you have Bruce Springsteen there and little Steven and also Max Weinberg as well. It's so obvious when you listen to the Dave Clark Five how much of an influence they were on Bruce and the E Street Band which I hadn't really thought about too much when you consider the fact that the DC-5 had a sax player, which made their sound very unique. And obviously in the E Street Band, Clarence Clemens was such a huge part of the sound of of uh, the E Street Band. And also the fact, you know, Mike Smith, who was an amazing singer and a great R&B voice who can also handle the pop stuff as well. You know, I can hear Bruce singing a lot of the songs that the Dave Clark Five did. So right. when I get to hear some of the other artists talking about, you know, why the Dave Clark Five were important to them, and if anything that impressed me more more than what I just said, it's the fact that there are a lot of people who were interviewed in this special that represented a wide variety and different genres of music. You've got people from Bruce to Paul McCartney to uh, Stevie Wonder to Freddie Mercury to Ozzy Osbourne in there. Um, and uh, so that only proves Gene Simmons of Kiss is in there. So it tells you that different artists from every walk of life were influenced, or at least the Day Clark Five made an impact on them for different reasons. And so I like the special from that from that aspect of it, but I didn't feel like I learned too much about the history and what made them unique beyond the fact of you know they had this big sound this very raw energy, this raw power. And, um, you know, they, they had a sax player and, and, uh, and a keyboard player. Michael? Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about um, about the influence on all the people that were interviewed, um, I'm still not sure I understand the Whoopi Goldberg connection. <laughs> any any uh, takers on that one? That was kind of, yeah, that was kind of strange. That was definitely, um, definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't particularly catch that either. Well, maybe not as an influence, but just as a fan, what impressed her, the look of the Dave Clark Five and their sound and the fact that, like a lot of great pop records, the songs stick with you and, and the chorus you can sing in your head and everybody knows it. 
and that is in and of itself very powerful. Mm-hmm. But I was very surprised with the with the way this whole thing was done. In many ways, it impressed me quite a lot. But I, I often wonder, in the whole scheme of things, taking a look at all the great British invasion artists, where where do the Dave Clark Five really rank? Thinking of it in, in this day and age, when you look back at all the great artists that we've had, and what is their lasting impact? And, you know, do you think that all these artists and what they had to say, as well as Dave Clark and Mike Smith, did that really give you a full understanding of what the Dave Clark Five were all about and where their standing is today? Well, I'll tell you, it's, you know, I mean, having been through that time and remembering them very well, I think for anybody who was old enough to remember, you know, and, and for first generationers, I almost, if they feel like me, I think the Dave Clark Five were second to the Beatles. They were they were the the second biggest band at the time. Now I think for people who are a little you know who are are younger, I'm not sure that's the case. But I think it's at the time the impact of the Dave Clark Five was second only to the Beatles, and it's not from the the perceived uh, rivalry thing that they that. Uh, was in the media, you know, that was part of the magazines and stuff. I don't think it had anything to do with that, but yeah, I mean, they were, they were, they were very, they were right up there. They were definitely right up there. I think I'd, I'd put the Searchers third. Maybe that's a personal thing because I'm a real big Searchers nut. But yeah, I mean, they were. It was, you know, the it was definitely the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five first and second. Michael, is that? I don't know how old you are, but uh, is that how you feel? All right, first of all, the uh, how old am I question. Let's just say uh, uh, Dave Clark Five were done before I uh, knew my name. Okay. But, uh, okay. Um, so so as, I'm, the, I'm the elderly guy here, apparently. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can understand why uh, why it would seem like that in America, because, I mean, I guess they were, the Dave Clark Five were, like, the first band to come over to America after the Beatles. I mean, as it was said in that special, they were the first group to tour America, you know, to do an actual tour. Right, and in fact, I think that's one of the that's in one of the clips that I think we'll we'll be playing. But yeah, they were they were, and they and they were on the Sullivan Show more than any other British group. Right. So yeah, I that, mean, the the number of that keeps changing every time I see it. You know, how many times we were on the Ed Sullivan Show? I think it's currently eighteen. But uh, yeah, I, I tried. You know, I tried to look that up at one point when I was writing through the the interview I did with Dave Clark, and um, yeah, it. <laughs> It was hard. I, I probably should have asked him specifically, and I don't think I did um, how many that was. But um, well, yeah, I mean, they, they concentrate. You know, as you know, they concentrated mainly, or especially, on the American media because actually, uh, and of course, this wasn't made. I don't think it was made that clear in the special. Dave Clark Five actually didn't chart that well in England at first. I mean, yeah, Glad All Over was a number one hit in some of the early songs, but after that, it wasn't. Big hit after big hit, like it was in America mm-hmm. at first. I mean, they did all right. I mean, they certainly had a nice chart account. But uh, it actually wasn't until the hits ran out in America, like in 67. I think their last big hit over here was, uh, I guess, You Got What It Takes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was uh, right about that time they started having better hits in, uh, or better luck in England. Uh, kind of similar to the Herman's Hermits, too. Uh, you know, bigger in America at first, but then they parted out here and then uh, picked up steam in England. So I... Uh, I have been following the the British chart things every week, you know, because of the Beatles' um, 50th, and I've been writing about it. And I, though I haven't been writing down everybody's chart hits, I have noticed that yeah, the the Dave Clark Five did okay over in the over in Britain at the 50 years ago, but they certainly didn't have the flood of songs on the charts. That the Beatles did in America. Actually, nobody did over there. Even the Beatles really didn't have as many hits on the, you know, on the weekly charts as as they did in America. It was it's really strange. Well, that's and? because in '64 we suddenly got all the early stuff coming out at the same time, catching up right. to what they were doing. So you had so many hits in '64 in particular, and then it slowed down in '65. Mm-hmm. But um, you know what struck me, and, and again, this is this is not really news to me because I'm pretty much a chart buff myself, and I know that the Dave Clark Five had so many hits in America up through about '67, 
And you could say that they were probably the biggest hit makers of, of the British bands next to the Beatles. But my point is that after that, I mean, what is the legacy of the Dave Clark Five overall? Because they were basically a band that had a lot of hits. They're not really known for their album cuts. They're not really known for specific albums that they made. And once 67 kicked in, and that became the period when album rock started to become, you know, uh, such a, an important part of radio. It was developing, and and uh, radio was going deep into album cuts and everything. By then, at least in America, the Dave Clark Five really weren't doing all that well. So I'm I'm so much influenced, unfortunately, <laughs> by radio and and being brought up by it here in America, and, and I know that. You know, if you listen to oldies radio, especially at a time when oldies radio plays 60s music, and there are more and more stations now that are eliminating 60s music, you did hear the Dave Clark Five, but you wouldn't have heard them on a classic rock station. So they were basically known in America for a sizable number of hits, and they deserve a lot of credit because those are great records. There's no doubt about it. But what what I find really surprising here, there was a quote from Elton John where he said, the three giants to come out of England, were the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the Dave Clark Five. And in my mind, I'm thinking also because of longevity, although that shouldn't be the, the only criteria that you base this on, but obviously you've got to be thinking about the Who and the Kinks and bands like those that lasted so long and had so much success going on into the 70s and 80s and all that. I think when people look back at the British Invasion, those are considered the greatest bands. I don't really... This is just me now. I don't really put Dave Clark Five in that category. I see them as mainly a singles act, and a great singles act, but one that kind of petered out after a few years. Well, I disagree with you to a point because in the before, for what was it, you know, six, seven months before the Who and the and the Stones, well, the Stones came in around four months before the Who and the Stones came in, and the you know the later British Invasion wave. It was basically, we're talking about the Beatles, the Dave Clark Five, Peter and Gordon, the Kinks, Chad and Jeremy to a certain extent. Right, the Animals. Uh, um, the Animals, yeah. We're talking about, you know, we're just talking about a handful of of groups. And among that handful, that early handful, it was the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five. And they, they were, the two of them were really at the top of the heap. Um, You're only talking about the initial, the the first group of British invasion bands that struck big. So mm-hmm. just that that initial wave. That's what you're talking about. I can see that. Well, even but even later though, the I mean the obviously the Beatles had longevity, but the Dave Clark Five still continued to to have you know a lot of hits later on. It's not like they completely fizzled out. So. I would not want to, you know, say that you know they were a short-term thing. They they really weren't. Michael, how do you feel about this? Well, to go back to the original quote from Elton John, you got to wonder how much of that quote was just inspired by the fact that okay, he knows he's doing a quote for a Dave Clark special, so he's he, you know he might have been just you know uh, you know inflating it a bit just for the sake or just to give a good quote or just I don't know. Yeah, that quote about the greatest artist of all time was was yeah that was a little bit of. That was a little too much. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Well, that was, that was basically it. That, that, that's why, like, you know, uh, when he made that quote, I didn't really think too much of it. I mean, I, I mean, maybe he was. I mean, maybe maybe he was looking from a perspective of the media, like uh, maybe the, uh, Dave Hark Five were getting uh, a lot more um, press than, let's say, Herman Sermits were at first or the Searchers, so it seemed like they were giants, you know, whether or not longevity um, weighs that out. Uh, don't know. Mm-hmm. Don't know Mr. Reginald's... Uh, mind hmm but even still you take a band like the animals and the animals were still having hits into the late 60s you know so i i'm not i'm not trying to put down the dave clark five i love those records i really do but in the whole scheme of things i mean i just wrote down just for the heck of it all the artists that come to my mind in the british invasion of the 60s real quickly i'm just going to read them real fast the beatles the rolling stones the animals the kinks the who peter and gordon chad and jeremy the hollies the Zombies, Donovan, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Yardbirds, Herman's Hermits, Petula Clark, Freddie and the Dreamers, Manfred Mann, 
uh, Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders, the Small Faces, and uh, the Day Clark Five. I mean, there's probably a few that I'd missed. But when you take a look at all those great artists right there, I mean, do the Dave Clark Five really deserve to be thought of, you know, in the top three? Everybody has to look at the Beatles and the Stones as as one and two. So, you know, I, I don't know if I would agree with Elton John's comment, but, you know, it could be like you said, Michael, that he was doing this for a Dave Clark special. Yeah, I kind of wonder if Dave Clark was in the room when he said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that, but... Uh... But there's no question that, at least at least in the very beginning, and to a certain extent later on, the Dave Clark Five were very much up there. And if you go through the list, I'm looking at a list of their songs from 60, 64 to 65. Let me, and I'm going to limit it to those two years, even though there are some great songs after 64 and 65. We're talking bits and pieces. Glad All Over actually came out in 63, but bits and pieces. Can't you see that she's mine? Because thinking of uh, uh, thinking of you, baby, which is not really a big hit. Any way you want it, everybody knows. Come home, I like it like that. Catch us if you can, and over and over. I mean, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty dynamite list right there. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, so. to take that a step further, uh, here's a little trivia I sometimes uh, put out about the Dave Clark Five. I don't know if this is a fact, but. In early 1966, uh, their American label, Epic, put out a Greatest Hits album. And I wonder if that was the first time there was ever a Greatest Hits album in the world of rock music anyway, in which every single song on the album was a bona fide hit. I mean, there was nothing, you know, sometimes they put some, you know, lesser things or things that weren't hits at all just to fill it up. Mm -hmm. they, were at, they were actually getting a, a full Greatest Hits album out, out of, uh, you know, indisputable hits. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 honestly, right I honestly don't know about that. That's, uh, that's interesting. Well, talk about the, the influence that the Dave Clark Five have had. I mean, there was some mention there. Uh, Max Weinberg was talking about Dave Clark's drumming and just how in his live performances there are times when he'll play fills like Dave Clark did. And he was very much, um, he, he liked what Dave Clark did with um, the snare drum and the toms. Um, and the fullness of the sound of the Day Clark Five, that was a big a big thing for Max Weinberg. But talk about that. Talk about any other influence that they might have had on other artists, Michael. Any other influence? Well, I mean, you get the occasional cover. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, Gene Simmons was on a special, you know, Kiss the Diversion of Any Way You Want It. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting record for its time. I mean, that was probably... Uh, that might have been the heaviest record out in 1964. I mean, that's you know that's a thunderous sound. I mean, I'm not going to say that that inspired heavy metal. I don't want to go that far, but I mean, uh, but I mean, uh, some bands might have taken an idea from that or two. Oh, hmm. I think I think bits and pieces is even heavier than that. Um, well, I, well, I know. I just um, I, it, well, that's definitely a strong record too. I mean, in another way, because that's got um, you know that strong drum sound. But I mean, just the the way that any way you want it is so layered. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. definitely like bits and pieces. Um, that's a record, you know. It's you know it makes you want to stomp. So that's that's exciting I know. too. Uh, um, and they do that a lot, where they have every beat. Um, uh, the drums often had emphasis on uh, their records, uh, but the snare on all four quarter beats, uh, not just the two and the four. Glad all over does that. Bits and pieces. Uh, do you love me? Any way you want it. Even later on, like you got what it takes. That does that too. And when you do that kind of a beat, you know it's a pretty stomping sound. Uh, you want to stomp your feet. So that was kind of interesting. And uh, Michael, that's an interesting point. And, and, I, and I think Dave, Dave talked with me about that too. Where, but, but basically, what you're saying is he fashioned the beat for that stomping kind of rhythm, correct? Right. And um, later, other bands were doing that too. Like, uh, I mean, in 1964, you had "Have I the Right" by the Honeycombs. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make a call like uh, that. Any other band that did that kind of a beat was intentionally borrowing from the Dave Clark Five, because you mm -hmm. know, it's not always a straight line. And uh, there were R&B records doing that too, but that was certainly something you heard uh, here and there after the Dave Clark Five hit, so maybe. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So you could conceivably give Dave Clark some credit for that kind of pioneering sound, right? Yes, uh, although I also have to say, though, uh, that in the last couple of weeks when the Dave Clark Five were on everybody's minds because of the special I did put that question to some drummers uh, that I know, uh, mostly drummers who, you know, were alive when the British invasion happened, and uh, I asked them if the DC Five were an influence, and uh, 
the you know, people I talked to, they basically told me that, yeah, they liked the records a lot, but no, they didn't really take anything from them as far as drumming, at least not consciously. Although one told me that the fact that the band centered around the drummer, that was intriguing. Uh, so that counts, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so give them points for that. Yeah. Ken? Um, you know, actually, I just wanted to bring up one thing, because you told me about this privately, Steve, something that mm-hmm. Dave Clark said to you about what Freddie Mercury said to him. Right. As far as the, the sound on Dave Clark Five Records and how that influenced a, a major Queen song. Mm-hmm. We Will Rock You, they they, they took that from, from uh, the Dave Clark Five. And also, the Monkey theme was, was influenced by the Dave Clark Five. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, and, and I'm not sure, you know, I have to say, I, um, I'm not sure I was totally aware, if I was aware of that kind of influence, it wasn't until the special that I, you know, I was really, it really came out, um, but that's, it, that's interesting. Now, you could probably argue that that's Dave Clark, you know, kind of, again, promoting his legacy, but, I mean, I think... At least I know the monkey story has been around for a while because after I wrote about that, uh, you know, several people had commented they'd heard that before, and then others said they had not. But I don't know. But um, it, I mean, that's interesting, and I wouldn't doubt that the, the Dave Clark Five had some had some, definitely some influence. There's no there's no reason not to. So what what you you're basically saying here, based on what Dave Clark said to you, is that the stomping sound. And We Will Rocky was actually inspired. It was taken kind of from bits and pieces, that kind of sound. Well, that, they, I mean, as he said in the special and as as he went over with me, their sound came from um, playing at, um, at uh, military bases in the U.K. But I'm they, talking about We Will Rock You and how that was influenced. Oh, yeah, that's definitely, he, he definitely says that in the special. And he also, says that for the, the people who are wondering, since you just... Um, you know, alluded to it. The monkey's theme, uh, I believe, it was taken or was influenced by Catch Us If You Can. Right. Uh, I believe it was Tommy Boyce um, had sent Dave Clark a letter and, and confirmed that that uh, it was. I definitely heard one of them say that in an interview. I forget whether it was Boyce or Hart, but I, I have heard them themselves say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another and another thing you can look at an influence uh, the turtles. Uh, they kind of brought it home, so to speak, because it's been said that uh, one song that the DC-5 liked a lot and inspired bits and pieces and glad all over was uh, uh, Your Ma Said You Cried in Your Sleep Last Night, Kenny Dino. Well, the the Turtles did it on their first album, and they gave it a real bits and pieces feel, so uh, like un- intentionally. Uh, so they brought it full circle, although for all I know, that could have been a way of saying, uh, ha-ha, we know where you stole it from. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And um, another group that, that did a lot of you know, that uh, pushed the drummer to the forefront also was the Searchers, which didn't, although Mike Pender was really big with the Searchers, their drummer, I guess, sang, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, that's how that's how big he is, but... Chris um, Curtis. Chris Curtis, thank you. Um, Curtis Curtis sang. When you, you know, I guess when you look at the Beatles and you, and you see Ringo, who, who did not sing very much, and you see drummers like Chris Curtis, who took a more active role, it's like, oh my God... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, I mean, there were uh, now Clark didn't sing very much. I mean, obviously, uh, Mike Smith was the one that sang there, but Clark yeah. did Clark did sing once in a while. So yeah, he uh, well, as far as singles, uh, one of their latest singles, uh, "Red Balloon," that's Dave Clark singing. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it was about ninety something percent Mike Smith, and occasionally uh, there were a couple singles where uh, or a couple tracks Lenny Davidson took the lead too. Uh, Everybody knows that the, the the second everybody knows the ballad one. Well, actually, mm-hmm. I guess they were both ballads, but you know the one from '67. Right. Um, yeah, that's Lenny Davidson. Mm-hmm. But yeah, for the most part, it was Mike Smith. Okay, I should point out um, that part of the reason why we're doing this on the Dave Clark Five, and obviously they were such a huge part of the British invasion, is because Paul McCartney is featured in in this special. And also, and I was kind of surprised to see this towards the end, there was a lot of time devoted, no pun intended, to the musical time, and Julian Lennon is featured in this documentary. So more reason for Beatle fans to go and check this out. But I wanted to bring up another thing that was said here in this special, and this came from Steve Van Zant, and he actually said that um, Dave Clark and Mike Smith as a team, they were as good a team 
as Lennon and McCartney and Jagger and Richards. Your thoughts on that? How about you, Michael? Well, this brings up a whole new can of worms uh, because <laughs> there's been some uh, question as to how much of those songs, uh, how much Dave Clark really did to the songwriting. Uh, there's a guy who was completely not mentioned in the special who uh, Dave Clark 5 fans have heard of, Ron Ryan. He was an early associate of the group and there have been a lot of... Uh, uh, claims that he actually wrote a lot of the songs, uh, some of the early hits, sometimes on his own, sometimes with Mike Smith, but often not getting the credit, I think maybe even completely never getting the credit, and often having Dave Clark's name put in there. So uh, I know that's not where you were going to go with that, but hmm. uh, that's something that should be mentioned to some degree. Okay. No, uh, thank you. Thank, I'm glad you did mention that. Yeah, that's uh, that's been, I've seen that discussed on the Internet uh uh, since the special, and yeah, there's been a lot of mention of of that, but uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, that's, that's very strange. It's very. I mean, it kind of goes in with the whole Bobby Graham thing too. About uh, although I don't think the Bobby Graham thing personally is as significant as the Ron Ryan thing. That's actually more significant. Right, but um, but if you just want to talk about you know the the songwriting quality uh, compared to Jagger and Richards and uh, Lennon and McCartney. Uh, well, they were definitely catchy records. Uh, lyrically, they were pretty uh, pretty simple. I mean, David Clark, uh, in an interview, uh, I mean, we're talking about an interview that goes back to the 60s. I mean, he said he made a point of always keeping it simple, you know, no real messages, you know, music should just be about fun. Mm -hmm. So he, he never really got, I think on purpose, they never really got too deep with the lyrics. I mean, that's true, because, I mean, they never really got topical. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, was, it was pretty much just... Uh, Straight ahead love songs, and you know, very good ones. I mean, I'm not criticizing it, but uh, but whereas uh, John and Paul might take things in a more interesting direction, you know, more unauthorized, not, I don't mean unauthorized, unorthodox direction lyrically, you mm -hmm. know, getting to some different uh, areas, and certainly Jagger and Richards did that too. Uh, whoever wrote the Dave Clark Five songs, whether it was really Dave and Mike or whoever, uh, pretty much stayed down a pretty uh, straight path. But they were in no, no way in the same league. As the others, right? I wouldn't put them in that league, but but still, the results were good. Hmm. I'm only bringing yeah, this I, up I, because I, because Stephen Van Zandt said that. But I think that might have been another case where you know they're consciously doing a special for Dave Clark, so they want to butter things up a bit. Well, right. I, I do happen to believe, like you saw Bruce and and Steve Van Zandt together several times throughout the special, that the Dave Clark Five really were a big influence on on them. And well, I don't I, doubt that at all. And um, I, I, another thing that was brought to light here, which I hadn't given Dave Clark credit for, I really think that he was a very good arranger and producer for their records. You take a you take a song like um, "You Got What It Takes," that's a very unique arrangement there. I love what they did with that song. So you know, a lot of that you have to give credit to Dave Clark for that. Right. And also, they bring up the whole idea that he managed them and what a good businessman he proved to be. So, you know, Dave Clark's influence goes beyond the music in some aspects. Right. And one thing, getting back to the songwriting, um, they did develop as, so as songwriters because uh, the Dave Clark Five, like everybody else did, went through their little psychedelic kind of period. I guess I think you could call it Red Balloon a little, uh, a little bit of psychedelic type stuff. They certainly weren't the de developed songwriters that Lennon and McCartney were. Uh, sure. I, uh, because they basically stuck with love songs the whole, you know, just about all the way down until even, uh, even uh, except for the very end when they actually kind of went back to uh, when they did good old rock and roll and they did that, uh, you know, the kind of retro rock thing. But, yeah, I mean, they basically they basically stayed with love songs the whole time. Hmm. Yeah, and they did have their psych period, like you said. They have a track called Maze of Love. I think it was a B-side. I don't think it was an A-side. i got to check on that. But uh, mm -hmm. um, very Sgt. Pepper-like. I mean, li the, the song Sgt. Pepper, that is, because uh, actually the guitar parts on Maze of Love sound like uh, consciously borrowed right from that track. So uh, so they uh, yeah, the, so they didn't uh, have a complete blind eye to the psych movement, but they uh, they kind of uh, they kind of stepped at it as, as a point as, a, as opposed to, like, diving into it. Yeah, I was thinking Red Red Balloon and Live in the Sky are the two songs that, uh, if I had to think of of their uh, psychedelic period, uh, those are the ones I would mention. Um, so, but because uh, 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 
what does, I'm trying to remember. Live in the Sky has the cheering cr- football crowd, doesn't it? Is right, that that's the one that sounds very uh, Yellow Submarine-ish. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. That's kind of a beat. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they, I mean, everybody, everybody played that game. Everybody, I mean, the Stones did too, for that matter. You know, but, um, yeah, the, they they definitely tried to go that route. But they just didn't hang there long enough as, as some other people did. At that point, at that point, I think, Michael, you and Ken, you would probably agree that they, they were kind of on a downturn. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the basically because of what the Beatles were doing, you know, and and it was actually at that point in in um, you know in uh, when once once uh, Clark Clark said that once they he said in the special once they realized you know their day was over they were gonna they went out uh, you know in 1970 um, rather than hang on so yeah that was one of the um, one of the few things I did learn from the special. Um... It was news to me. Now I knew they broke up in 1970, and I knew that it was a, I think, a relatively, uh, you know, easygoing split, not one based on arguments or anything like that. But it was interesting that they actually had like a, you know, months in advance, you know, set date when they were going to break up. I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what was it about 1970? All the great groups broke up. Yeah. <laughs> it's the start of a new yeah. decade. Time to move on. I, gu- yeah. I guess. I guess so. I mean, it made it made perfect sense. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I guess that was it. You know, so, Steve, you did an interview with Dave Clark, and we have a few clips here. And uh, is there one in particular that you want me to play? Because it would be nice the to The reunion achieve. one, I think, is probably, or the, not the reunion, the, the rivalry one is probably a really good one to to play. Cause he, and, and also the one, if we, if we have time to do both, the one where he compares the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five. Okay. I think those two, the the rivalry thing, I think, is probably really interesting. It's probably most relevant. All right. Why don't we play that right now? This is our own Steve Marinucci talking on the phone with Dave Clark. What did you guys think of the whole Beatles-Dave Clark 5 rivalry? Was there really a rivalry? This no, there wasn't. And I think I was, I was very flattered when Paul agreed to come on the, 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 the documentary, and he actually summed it up. There wasn't a rivalry. It was... Uh, in England in 1963, most of the hit records were from Liverpool. You know, you had the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Silla Black, Billy mm-hmm. J. Kramer and the Decoders. And then all of a sudden, a group from London just took off. And we were selling like 180,000 records a day and we're still number two. We had to sell nearly two million copies to knock the Beatles off their biggest selling single, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Get mm-hmm. number one, and we ended up selling two and a half million. But no, the boys in, the boys were playing in London. They invited us down. We went to their show backstage. We all went out to a club after to celebrate. There was no, there was no rivalry. The, fr- the press made the rivalry, and I think Paul stated that fact, and the Americans um, followed it up. Dave Clark, they're talking to Steve. Interesting comments there from Dave. Yeah, I, I I I I thought that was very interesting too. Is uh, yeah, Michael, what, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean uh, that whole thing started, you know, as he kind of alluded to when uh, Glad All Over knocked. I want to hold her hand out of number one in England, and the papers were making a huge thing that the uh, Tottenham sound toppled Mersey Beat. You know, you know, as if we, as if uh, you know, we should all be surprised that a record didn't stay at number one forever. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, Brian Poole and the Tremolos had knocked the Beatles out of number one early in the year. They didn't make a thing, you know, they didn't say like a tremolo mania was taking over. So uh, I don't think they were just looking for a story. Who knows? But the fact yeah, that they, well, they, they went out and celebrated together. I mean, Dave just said that. They went to a club together after the success of Glad All Over. And, but, and their, their, their billboard ads, the Dave Clark Five bill, billboard ads, were very much Tottenham sound takes on mercy beat sound so uh, i mean they they exploited that in their ads too so you know but you know it's, it's just like the way the beatles and stones rivalry was r- rivalry was uh, you know made more of what it really was too mm-hmm. well it, it, it i mean that still kind of goes today you know there's so many of these you know rivalries and all these quote quote celebrity stories that are basically puffed up by pr guys to get press, and uh, the same thing was true in '64, though not really to the extent that it is now. Hmm. 
Did you want to play the uh, the other clip of uh, Dave comparing the Dave Clark Five yeah. with the Beatles? Well, yeah, let's comp- let's play that one. Okay, here we go. What was the biggest difference between the Beatles and the Dave Clark Five, as far as you were concerned? The difference. I, mm-hmm. Well, I, I I think first of all the lineup, because we had sax, we had keyboard, organ, and my all guitar, all, all groups in those days were really three guitars: rhythm guitar, lead guitar, bass mm-hmm. guitar, and drums. And I felt the sound was different. I always made the drums prominent so that we got a, a, a different a different sound. It was nothing over clever. I always believe when you make records, it's the gaps that you leave that give you that make things work. You can show more by doing less. So if you leave a gap, a guitar lick or a drum lick or whatever, that comes through, and it just worked for us. And that's it. Dave Clark talking go. about uh, the comparisons there. Um, no, I, th- I love that word, over-clever. <laughs> I thought that was a great word. But, yeah, I mean, he did, you know, he basically just you know said it in a, in a nutshell. I mean, he really didn't say a whole heck of a lot there. You know, I was looking more for the personality type of thing, because there really w- the, per- the Beatles personalities were a lot more pronounced than the Dave Clark Fives were. There was the and between Mike Smith and Paul McCartney, you know, because they both kind of looked like looked the, looked uh, the same. They were both really handsome guys, but uh, you never knew about the other three. You know, you never knew about the other three guys. I mean, you heard about Dave a little bit, but uh, because his name was on the group, but you never really heard about the other guys. Whereas you knew John Paul George and Ringo. That was a very conscientious effort on the part of the Beatles to establish each one of them, oh, identity-wise, sure. you know. And oh, yeah. uh, what other band Michael, could you, you say you, that you about? Agree yeah. With that? Yeah. Oh, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, um, you knew mainly Dave. He got you know most of the attention. You know, it helps when your name is in the name of the group. And uh, yeah, Mike since he was the front man. But yeah, I don't know how many uh, Lenny Davidson or Rick Huxley fans there were out there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean even even Mike didn't get the attention in '64. And it's only been, you know, it was it was when he did the solo tour. I mean, well, I should say, in in later years, it was, you know, when people when people look back on the group, they went, hey, who's you know who's that singer? And they realized it wasn't Dave Clark, it was Mike Smith. And then, of course, when the accident happened, everybody, when the tour happened, when his solo tour happened, and then the accident, everybody really knew who Mike was. And that, uh, you know, sadly, it did. Too bad it didn't, things didn't end differently or go differently, but every, you know everybody seems to recognize. And even Dave, even Dave said specifically because I asked him point blank about Mike as as a vocalist, and he agreed that he was very underrated. So, indeed, indeed, very. very I mean, he, he really, you know you really can't deny that you cannot. And and I think you know, and I think I've said this here. Or I've said this, I've written it, that I think Mike is one of the greatest vocalists in rock and roll ever. I mean, he was just fantastic. So. I agree. Guys, what is it after all these years that impresses you about the Dave Clark Five? Is it mainly the hits that they had, or, or is there any, for you, a lasting impact that they've had on, on you? Michael, you go first. Uh, I think it's just uh, uh, very simply just catchy songs and great energy and... Uh... I like that they didn't waste time. I mean, their records uh, were almost always on the short side, so it's like they came in, got right down to business, went right to your brain, did their thing and left, uh, which is what a good single should be anyway, you know, good quick ride. But I think that was part of the appeal for the Dave, for uh, Dave Clark Five. You know, they came, they saw, they played the song, they left. Uh, they left you wanting more. Hmm. I'm I'm looking over the list of their of their recordings, and it looks like up through or uh, the big and um, the the more well known songs. And it looks like through 19, close to 1970, or 68 was the first time they had when they actually went over three minutes of the mm-hmm. well-known songs of the singles. So that's that's a you know an interesting point that yeah they did keep them under under three minutes. You know as far as the music goes, I mean I've always liked their music a lot. What's interesting is they never they are not overexposed, uh, unlike some other people that you hear a lot. You know, Dave Clark Five really have never been overexposed. For one, their CDs aren't in print, right. which is really crazy. And Dave did tell me that he's working on he he's thinking about it 
quote, quote, thinking about it, which I don't understand that at all. I mean, these should be out there. He does have them all on iTunes. Uh, everything is on iTunes. He's remastered all the albums and put them on iTunes. There's a bunch of un, uh, unreleased track albums. There's three of them. But it's crazy that they're not they're not av- more available. I guess he figures CDs are dead or something. I don't know. But it's too bad that uh, this stuff has not been out there for so long. The stuff only got on iTunes a couple of years ago, which is really, I mean, that's just, if you look on Amazon for the prices on some of the Dave Clark 5 CDs, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. And it's stupid. It doesn't make but, any sense. He's got to realize that there's a demand out there for the fans who grew up on this music. And the thing is that there are unauthorized, of course, the bootleggers have taken, you know, taken uh, a shot. And there's there's one collection, I can't remember how many CDs it is. I think it's like seven or eight volumes called The, the Complete History of the Dave Clark Five. It puts together just about everything. Yeah, and and I mean, it, it helps that they can keep it short because, I mean, the average Dave Clark 5 album was about 20 minutes. <laughs> right. Well, these are like 20, 25 tracks a piece uh, for seven albums, and that's pretty astounding yeah. that there is that many, that there's that much stuff around, but there is. So, I mean, he should put it all out. Put it all out and make make the money yourself, Dave. You know, there you go. <laughs> And for me, I would say they were a really great powerhouse singles band. And, uh, you know, for that short period of time, although you would say it was longer, but certainly for that stretch from 64 through 67 or 68, there's so many great songs in there. And like you said, yeah. Michael, they're all short. I mean, the the great R&B vocals of Mike Smith on so many of those songs and how strong it was. And even Bruce Springsteen pointed it out with, um, what song was it? I like it like that. Or mm-hmm. you got what it takes. Those songs, and because is one of my favorite pop songs of all time. Julian, uh, those, that's the song Julian covered. Julian, Julian did Julian about covered that. Julian did three songs for the soundtrack of time, and that was one oh, of did them. Did he? I, I know he covered because though. So. Yeah. So. Well, they, they got uh, another one of the songs in there in in this special called "Time Will Teach Us All." In fact, mm-hmm. um, Stevie Wonder's on that song too. And that's not on CD. That's another, another interesting thing is that Time Musical that he he is so very fond of is not on CD. It's not on video. It's you know. I think I think it used to be on CD. Is it discontinued or it just never was? Or? I think it's I think it's it's discontinued. And of course, he also owns the rights to Ready Steady Go, mm-hmm. which is something else that should be that would be marvelous on DVD. Be marvelous on Blu-ray. Well, there um, were there were video collections that came out. Right. Well, he showed he originally showed them on the Disney Channel, which is an, an odd kind of decision. But they did come out on on video, and um, but they have not been issued on DVD. So here he and is. That includes the whole Beatles show. He's so he proud whole, of he. Yeah, uh, he did a whole Beatles Ready Steady Go show. He's so proud of that series and the fact that that he took it upon himself to own it, and then he doesn't release it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. That's very. I don't know what he's waiting for. I, think I, I don't know. I, I don't know. All right, so in, in the whole scheme of things, where would you rate the Dave Clark Five as far as uh, all the, the great British invasion bands? I mean, you already answered this in a way, Steve, but I want Michael's take on this. Okay. Uh, I know I just put them as a very, very good one, just with enjoyable records, and I don't... Um... I mean, you could say they were way up there, and I suppose they were to some degree, but, you know, I just uh, I just enjoy the music, and that's enough for me. Hmm. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, if, if if any artist has a handful of great songs that live on forever, that alone is, is a tremendous accomplishment, and this band certainly did just that. So before we close, Michael, I know that you have a, a new single out you want to talk about? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, it's um, I do some solo material. I have some available at Michael Lynch Music. That's all one word, Michael Lynch Music at bandcamp.com. Uh, I have a new 45. It's called "She's on Her Way," which uh, some people and reviewers are calling Beatleish. I thought it was being like the love and spoonful, but I'll take Beatles if they want to say Beatles. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's up there. Uh, Michael Lynch Music at Bandcamp dot com. Yeah, that's, I hope you enjoy it. You know, there's something else I just wanted to bring up because several years ago you hosted a podcast show, which was called "Ready Steady A Go Go." That's right. Yeah, and was, um, uh, yeah, is that still online? I think the old episodes are still online at. Anchor, N-A-N-K-E-R, 
www.podomatic.com. Um, haven't done a new one since 2009, but uh, I did it for three years, so there should be uh, uh, about three years worth of shows on there. Uh, I called it From Mersey Beat to Mod was the subtitle, uh, 62 to 66. Uh, it's got a lot of obscure stuff. I play some hit. A lot of the bands you know, but maybe tracks, uh, lesser-known tracks by those bands, and maybe bands you never heard of at all. Hmm. Try to just get the whole era represented in one way. Cool. Okay. So if you want to get a taste of uh, what Michael Lynch's work has been on the air and, and his passion for this music, definitely check that out. Ready, steady, a go-go. Kind of ironic, we're talking about ready, steady, go. <laughs> so really? it, just, it suddenly dawned on me, hey, he had this radio program. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Ken. It was a pleasure. And as soon as there's a Freddy and the Dreamers documentary on PBS, we're going to bring you back. I'm busy that day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, if people want the theme to our show, is there any way they can get it? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, that's on a different site uh, because that one's not for sale, but it's uh, you go to SoundCloud dot com slash michael lynch music and on that page we'll find something called theme for ken and steve which is the theme <laughs> for things we said today because because <laughs> i knew i couldn't call it things we said today is there a longer version of the song uh no that's pretty much it it's just whatever it is 30 seconds uh it, you know I, I was inspired by the day of clark five i left it short <laughs> are you doing a backwards version too <laughs> <laughs> yes you should be the theme for Steve and Ken. I already said that on the show. All so right, now, so well, now, you really want one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to hold you to that. And 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 of course the outtakes. The outtakes have to go up too. <laughs> oh boy, there there were plenty of outtakes to get that harmonica part right. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much for that. That's a great theme, by the way. Oh, my pleasure. I had fun making it. Yeah, okay. and uh, thanks for joining us for the show this time. This has been great. Thanks, guys. All right, this has been fun. Special thanks to Michael Lynch for joining us. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying, I hope all of you get the tickets to Paul McCartney you want, and we will see you next time. <laughs>